So hello everyone. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> hello everyone. Welcome to the Quantum Business Seminar. So uh, it is our honor today to have um, Dr. Mohammed Ami to um, give us an overview of his recent research. So um, Dr. Mohammed Ami is a fellow at the D Way Quantum Incorporated and an adjunct professor in the physics department of the Simon Fraser University. So he earned his PhD in condensed matter physics from UBC in 1999. And after that, he joins um, D-Wave. And since then, he has played a pivotal role in the development of D-Wave's large-scale quantum annular processes, processes um, contributing to both the theoretical experimental understanding of their complex behavior. So he has a broad range of uh, research interests, um, including the physics behind superconducting qubits, the noise and decoherence of superconducting circuits, the theory of open quantum systems and quantum critical phenomena, and also quantum machine learning. And today he will going to tell us more about the critical scaling advantages in spin glass uh, quantum optimization. Thank you. And thank you very much for, for your introduction. And it's an honor for me to, to give this presentation in this uh, seminar series. <clears throat> I wanna start uh, with, uh... okay. Uh, the, what I'm going to talk about is mainly uh, about this paper, which was published in Nature uh, earlier this year. This work was not possible without collaboration of uh, a lot of people. Only very few are listed in this paper. More than 200 people maybe should be listed, but we cannot. But among all those, I want to highlight uh, three people who did the, the key role here. Andrew King, who took the data, did the analysis, and uh, wrote most of this paper. Jack Raymond did most of the numerical simulations. And Anders Sandwich from Boston University helped us significantly with understanding the, the critical phenomenal part of this, uh, what I'm going to present. So, uh, First of all, let me tell you what problem we're trying to solve uh, in this paper. The, the problem we're trying to solve is an icing problem. And for those of, no, those of you who don't know what icing problem is, it's an optimization problem. And this is the cost function, which is a, a function of binary variables, SI, which could be plus or minus one. and and in the case of spin glasses, the, the, the coefficients hi and jij could be ra are random numbers, and therefore the landscape of this, this uh, cost function is very complicated. Here I'm trying to represent it in 1D. Of course, this is not a 1D problem. It's, it's, it's on a hypercube, but just, just for representation, 1D. I'm plotting this. And if you could do it in 1D, then you would see uh, local minima and global minima, it's very rough landscape. And the goal of this work is to find good solutions, maybe local minima or, or maybe global minimum or low energy local minima. If you want to do it classically, the, the easiest algorithm is greedy descent. So you randomly start from one point on this potential and just follow the gradient until you hit the minimum. And most likely you cannot find the global minimum. It's very likely that you, you will end up in a local minimum, which gives you an approximate solution. And if you wanna find the global minimum, you have to repeat this many, many times until you randomly land on the right valley that takes you to the global minimum. And it, this will take a, a significantly long time, which is exponential to the number of the, the spins. The, 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 uh, variables. A better idea is to use physics. And one way is to use uh, thermal annealing or the classical uh, algorithm version of that is called simulated annealing algorithm. And the way to do that is to introduce a physical Hamiltonian proportional to this icing uh, cost function. And now I'm replacing, if you notice, I'm replacing this SI, which were classical variables with, with Pauli matrices, but basically the same, the same cost function with some energy scale in front. Now, if I introduce a temperature, 
then the temperature does not allow the system to be uh, localized or, or stuck in a local minimum. And the, the, the thermal activation will kick the system out of local minimum. But if I very slowly lower temperature, when the temperature becomes smaller than all the barrier, the system will, will gradually go towards the global minimum and then finally reach the global minimum. But in order to do to, to reach the global minimum, you really need to, to bring down the temperature very slowly. That's where then the name annealing comes from. So very slow change of temperature. A quantum version of that is instead of introducing these fluctuations by temperature, you introduce them by, by quantum mechanically, by 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 introducing a term that does not communicate uh, commute with the cost function that you wrote. And the easiest way is just, just a sigma x Pauli matrices. Now, if this transfers field in this case is much bigger than all the energy barriers in, in your potential, then the wave function, the ground state of this Hamiltonian will be a superposition of all the states. So I'm just, schematically drawing yeah, like this this wide blue line as as the wave function in this in this a schematic 1d uh, potential but as, as i reduce gamma when the gamma becomes smaller than the barriers the wave function will be localized into minima and then if you lower the the gamma further and further it will localize into the global minimum and again, this has to be done very slowly. So this is basically the, the, the main concept of quantum annealing. But uh, what I haven't told you is which one of these three or, or other algorithms is better. And that's actually a central question in, in the field of quantum mechanics, not limited to quantum annealing, even in gate model. This is an open question whether quantum mechanics can speed up optimization. There's no rigorous proof that uh, a quantum mechanical algorithm can be done, uh, can beat classical algorithms. But for this talk, I'm gonna focus on quantum annealing. Early in the 20s, uh, uh, I mean, uh, 200s, or late in the 1990s, uh, the first experiment in quantum annealing uh, show that there could be this kind of advantage. This is a paper, a seminal paper by, by uh, Brooke et al, by Gabe Appling and Tom Rosenbaum, uh, one of the two authors, good author. And what they did is they looked at a, a frustrated magnet and they added this order to this frustrated magnet, and, uh, added the impurities to the magnet such a way that it has a, a, a spin glass phase. And then they cooled down the, from, the, from a hot temperature, they cooled it down towards the, the spin glass phase thermally. They also did it uh, quantum mechanically by introducing a large transverse field and then reducing the field. And in this case, it's a magnetic field, the transverse field and reduce the magnetic field to the same point in the spin glass. And they concluded that the quantum annealing converged faster than classical annealing. That was the first experimental evidence that, that quantum annealing could be faster. However, when you're dealing with, with a material, you cannot measure all the spins. So the spin configuration was unknown. You cannot even measure the, the, the energy. So even, even conclu concluding that you reach the ground state is, is not possible. They did it indirectly by looking at uh, AC susceptibility, but uh, this experiment was not repeated afterwards and, and was not repeated successfully even with programmable quantum annealers until now. So it, it remained an open question whether this 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 uh, kind of conclusion uh, remains valid if you do it on, on a programmer quantum annealer. 
on the theory side, uh, from the beginning, two school of thoughts emerged. Uh, the first school of thought emerged from the quantum computing community under the name of adiabatic quantum computation. And the, the idea was, you can think about this, this kind of annealing as, uh, if you look at the, the, the eigenstates of the, the system, if you anneal very slowly, you can look at it as you in, you're initializing from the ground state of some, some Hamiltonian that, that is easy to reach. And then you, if, you, if you anneal very slowly or evolve very slowly, you follow the ground state without excitation. And in the end, you find the optimal solution. You, you reach the final state. And the requirement is that the time of the annealing should scale as minimum gap squared. So this gives you some kind of mathematical way to think about how long you, you need to wait or how long it takes to solve this problem. And their, their initial conclusion, it is a Farhi et al. paper, which is a, the first paper, uh, proposed this, this line of thought. And the final conclusion was there is some evidence that quantum is faster than, than uh, classical, but later it turned out that it is not very easy to actually come to this conclusion this way. The main difficulty is finding the minimum gap is even harder than solving the problem. So it, it as nice as, as it looks like that there's a, a mathematical formula appearing, it is not very useful because you cannot solve, you cannot find the minimum gap easily. But what I want to emphasize is that there's two uh, the characteristics of this, this work that, that's very important. One of them is it, it looks at the exact solutions and not approximate solutions. So, so, so this is a way to only reach the exact solution and approximate solution that we cannot say much about approximate solutions. And the other thing is important uh, point about this work is the, because it, it emerged from a uh, quantum computing community, which is more focused on, on complexity, they, they, all they cared about is uh, a scaling of time with size, whether it's polynomial or exponential. Uh, and uh, uh, this can be seen from this figure that appeared in the same paper. The y-axis is time and the x-axis is the number of bits. In parallel with this, the, the second school of thought emerged within the Spingelas community, uh, started from Nishimori et al. But this is another paper, uh, seminal paper, again, appeared in science. All these three papers appeared in science in 2002. And in this paper, they used Monte Carlo, quantum Monte Carlo as a proxy for quantum annealing. They looked at spin glasses and they, in this figure, which is the main message of the paper, they looked at the residual energy, which is the average energy minus uh, the ground set energy as a function of time. And by time, they mean number of Monte Carlo sweeps. And they concluded that quantum Monte Carlo scales better than simulated annealing. And so in their case, they, they call it quantum annealing, but what it really is, is it's quantum Monte Carlo. And we know that quantum Monte Carlo does not simulate dynamics of quantum annealing. So this work does not really tell you much about quantum annealing. It just, it's a comparison between two classical algorithms. But there are also two important aspects of this paper. One is, which is very important for me, one is, it looks at approximate solution now. So if I, I told you in, in the adiabatic quantum computation, they only cared about exact solution. Now in this line of thought, they talk about approximate solutions, which, which appears in, in the form of residual energy. And the scaling they talk about is not time versus size, is energy versus time. And this is also important for the rest of my talk. But as I said, it is quantum Monte Carlo. It's not really, it does not tell you really where quantum annealing lands. 
real quantum annealing lands on this on this plot. And it took us 20 years and many generations of, of quantum annealing hardware until we had large enough and coherent enough quantum machine to answer this question. And this is the, the central result of, of the paper I mentioned at the beginning of the talk. And here you see uh, quantum Monte Carlo and similar annealing actually look very similar to, to the Santaro et al. paper. Uh, uh, quantum Monte Carlo is a little bit better than similar annealing. But it turned out that D-Wave actually is a lot better than both of them in terms of the scaling. Until the you your the annealing time is long, so that the temp temperature thermal ex excitation start to kick in and deviate from the the coherent annealing uh, uh, behavior. So this was a, a very very uh, uh, encouraging to us. But is this just a experimental artifact or just some empirical result, or can we understand this theoretically? Can we support this conclusion theoretically? And the rest of my talk mostly is about this. So is it possible to understand this, this, this difference theoretically? So let me start again by, by describing the problem we solved more uh, specifically. This is a 3D spin glass problem. It's a, a cubic lattice. This is a cubic lattice that we embedded. At each side of this cubic lattice, there are two qubits coupled ferromagnetically as a dimer, strongly ferromagnetically. And so this is basically a logical qubit representing a, a two physical qubits representing a logical qubit, which represent a spin in this 3D lattice. This sites or, or, or logical qubits are coupled by these pink couplers. Uh, which are which could be randomly plus or minus j g and j g is the the the, the spin glass coupling that we we tune we change and vertically we use two couplers to represent one coupler but then half of the magnitude so therefore in the end it's a 3d spin glass with with, with almost uniform isom uh, 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 tropic coupling in, in all three directions. I'm using L as linear size of this uh, 3D spin glass. And therefore the number of sites is L cubed and the number of qubits is two times L cubed because every site has two qubits. The Hamiltonian of this system is consists of uh, two parts, a transverse field, what I mentioned before, and then a longitudinal term, which is basically the icing uh, Hamiltonian with random JIJ. The evolution is by changing this gamma, this coefficients gamma and J in the following way. This, this, is, this is restricted by D-Wave uh, uh, processor. So at the beginning of the evolution, which time zero, the transverse field is maximum and, and, and the longitudinal term is almost zero. At the end of the evolution is the opposite. The, the, the transverse field is zero and then the longitudinal term is maximum. So therefore at the beginning, you start from a quantum paramagnetic phase and at the end, you end up in deep in the spin glass phase. And along the way, you have to pass a, a quantum phase transition from paramagnetic phase to a spin glass phase. If you could diagonalize this Hamiltonian, unfortunately, or you can't, or maybe fortunately, because if you could, then you wouldn't need a quantum computer. But if you could do it, you would see that, unlike the uh, picture that I showed you uh, at the beginning, uh, the, about adiabatic quantum computation, that there's a minimum gap that describes how long it takes to reach the, the final ground state. There's no single minimum gap and there are multiple places that the gap could close indeed. But you can uh, separate the places that the minimum gap 
the gap closes into two classes. One of them is second order phase transition. And the other ones is, I call them level crossings or first order phase transition. I will tell you what they are in, in a minute. But before that, the, the main difference between these two types of uh, minimum gaps is the second order phase transition, the gap is polynomial, which uh, shrinks polynomial with size. And the first order phase transition or level crossing, the gap shrinks exponentially with size. But let's tell uh, you in more detail what's, what are these. So the second order phase transition point is exactly what I said a minute ago, when, when you're moving or, or transitioning from a permagnetic phase or quantum permagnetic phase into a ordered phase. And by order, I mean, could be a spin glass phase, or it could be ferromagnetic phase or anti-ferromagnetic phase or, or any other order. If you could plot free energy of the system as a function of an order parameter, depending on which order uh, you choose in this order phase, you would see that the free energy is minimum at zero order parameter in the paramagnetic phase. But as soon as you pass the critical point, the order parameter moves spontaneously to one of the two minima. So move away from zero to one of two. And this, this is a spontaneous symmetry breaking. And this happens continuously. The barrier continuously raises. And this continuous spontaneous symmetry breaking is the reason that we have second order phase transition. And this holds for, for a ferromagnets, antiferromagnets, and even a spin glasses. This, this kind of picture holds. If you go further in the annual or go, go deeper by lowering the transverse field, you will find that the minimum that you reached at the second order phase transition may not continue to become to be the minimum at the end of annual. And, and one local minima, one of the local minima uh, before may come down and crosses the minimum that you are, your system is at the, at the symmetry breaking. And if you wanna follow the ground state, you have to, to jump between this local minimum and the global minimum at some point. And because of the barrier between, this has to happen through, barrier, through tunneling. And we know that quantum tunneling is exponentially suppressed by the height of the barrier that's why the minimum gap is exponential because at the minimum gap where these two barriers have the same energy and there's a the resonance, the, the minimum gap, the, the, the splitting is de determined by the tunneling between these two uh, uh, minima. So there are actually a number of papers in the literature about this type of minimum gap or level crossings. And I'm listing a few of them, few pioneering papers in the context of, of uh, adiabatic quantum computation. There are many, many more after. And uh, I don't wanna talk about this. This is not the topic of my presentation. What I'm gonna talk about mostly is, I mean, is about this second order phase transition. But, just by the way I plotted, I plotted this by hand. This is, this is no actual diagonalization, but I, I emphasize in this plot on one thing that you see the, the shape of the uh, spectrum near the level crossing or second order phase transition and uh, the, the first order phase transition and second order phase transition point is different. At level crossing, there are basically two eigenstates crossing each other with a bit with level of splitting. Uh, uh, and the, the these two are well separated from other uh, states with respect to the gap that 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 is very small. However, in the second order phase transition point, there's no isolated two state, there are many states. It's like a ladder of states and and if you approach the thermodynamic limit by increasing the number of qubits, the, 
these gaps all shrink and many, many, many levels are all together go down towards the ground state. So the, the best system to actually study this is a, a 1D ferromagnetic chain that, that uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about. In, the, in a 1D ferromagnetic chain, in the paramagnetic phase, there's a, a single ground state, which is basically the superposition of all, every qubit being both up and down. Um, near the end of the annealing, the system localizes and the, the, you get both ferromagnetic orders. And if the transfer field is, is, is zero, then you get degenerate state, degeneracy of, of both uh, orders. And going from this um, single phase and that thing, single eigenstate to a, a degenerate eigenstate happens at symmetry breaking. So what happens is one of the excited states come down at the critical point and joins and then symmetry breaking happens here. So one of these two will be selected. But more important is the, the, uh, the excited states. If you look at the first excited state near the critical point, it's a superposition of all the states with one kink. By kink, I mean a domain wall between two different orders of spins. And this domain wall could be at any place. And this state is superposition of all, these, all of these states. If you go higher in energy, you will find that you are you, the, you get superposition of smaller domains and more, many more kinks. And the higher you go, the, the smaller the domain and more, more, more and more kinks. And if I define a correlation length, a correlation length as the average size of these domains, then, then this means that the higher I go in energy eigenstates, the shorter the correlation becomes. And there's a relation, inverse relation between the energy and the correlation length. This is not just for 1D, for 2D and 3D, the same thing. So the higher the energy you go, the shorter the correlation length and the, 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 the larger, the, the smaller the domains that you find or, or the, the ordered domains that you find. Now, because you're annealing, you have a, also, you, you have to also think about time. And we know there's an a, a uncertainty relation between energy and time. So in more specifically, if, if, I, if I define a, a time delta t that you spend within this critical region where the gaps are, are small, if you spend very little time in this region, then there's an, the, you get a huge uncertainty in energy. And the uncertainty in energy will be inversely related to the total time or proportional to the speed of passing the critical point. But what does uncertainty in energy mean? It means that your wave function, if the wave function was just a ground state, a single eigenstate ground state at the beginning, once you reach this point, the wave function will not be a single state, will be a distributed state of superposition of many of these eigenstates up to the level that this gives you the, a, this uncertainty proportional to inverse time. But earlier I said, I told you, the higher you go in energy, the shorter the correlation time. This means there is a relation between how fast you pass the critical point and how short is the correlation length. So the shorter the time, the higher the energy, and the shorter the correlation length. And this is what we call kibble zurich mechanism. If you haven't heard, this is a way of thinking about kibble zurich mechanism. So kibble zurich tells you there's a relation between correlation length and the annealing time or the speed of passing the, the critical point. And because it's a critical dynamic, it's a universal dynamics, a universality behavior, there's a polynomial relation between correlation length and time. And the exponent we call Kibel-Zurich exponent. 
I don't want to go into uh, details where this relation comes from and what are these exponents. So these are two known exponents in critical phenomena, dynamic exponent and correlation length exponent. And, but if you don't know what these are, what I want to take uh, you to take from this uh, slide is this correlation length, this, this uh, critical exponent, you can calculate from quantum Monte Carlo simulation. So I told you earlier that, that quantum Monte Carlo does not simulate dynamics of quantum annealing. Now I'm telling you that quantum Monte Carlo actually can give you some information about dynamics of quantum annealing, although it doesn't simulate it completely. Quantum Monte Carlo can, can give you these, these numbers and then with these numbers, you can actually make some predictions how the system get ordered or create correlation in time. And this is this is very important, <clears throat> important part of our investigation uh, that I'm going to show next. So, for the first for the case of uh, a ferromagnetic chain that I introduced to earlier, these numbers are very uh, easy. So Z is one, and nu is also one, and one plus one is two. So it's very very simple numbers. Therefore, correlation length is a school, goes as a square root of time. Or we look at kink density, which is an inverse of correlation length. It should go as a square root of time to the power uh, one over a square root of time. And this is a, these are experimental results comp uh, that we have we published earlier in in uh, nature uh, last year in Nature Physics, and you see that. <clears throat> The slope of this, these curves, that the experimental curves, agree very well with the school of uh, time, which is, these are green lines. But more than that, you see that not only the slope is the same, but they, they, they actually like are very close. And these are, these are ex exact solutions using uh, uh, Jordan Wigner simulation. And there is no fitting parameter. So, so you, we put just qubit parameters in Jordan Wigner and we, we put it on this plot and it's, it's, it's right on top of each other. And this tells us that this, this machine actually is, show, uh, is following uh, coherent evolution up to some point where at this point, temperature starts to, to kick in and, and excite the system. And then you see temperature dependence starts here. So these are 10 different temperatures. But earlier in the anneal, I mean, faster annealing, uh, there is no temperature dependence. And again, it shows that we are following a coherent, coherent evolution without being affected by thermal environment. This is a 1D system. Now, how about 3D icing spring glass, which is the topic of the paper I'm going to uh, review for you. Again, I told you this, this, this Kibel-Zurich exponent, that is a key ex exponent in this relation, can be calculated using quantum Monte Carlo and also Glasgow Monte Carlo for Glasgow system. It's, it, we don't need to do it, although we did it all in our work. But we didn't need to do it because it's it's in the literature. People have done it before. So if you pick the numbers from these these two papers, you you find these two numbers for uh, critical exponent that relates correlation length with time. But one thing that you I want you to pay attention to is the quantum number is a smaller than classical number. What does it mean? It means that. The, the larger this mu is, the slower dependence of psi on t is. So that means you have to actually change time a lot until you see any effect in correlation length. So this will tells me that actually quantum dynamics is faster because by changing time, annealing time by a little bit, the system orders faster. But quantum, classically, I need to, to, to increase time by more to, to get the same, to see the same effect. So basically, 
the this just this these literature numbers, if you look at them, tells you quantum dynamics is faster than than classical. But does it mean that you can do faster optimization? Not yet. I, we have to demonstrate that uh, uh, later. But maybe this is a, a place to pause. Is there any question? Like uh, anybody has any question before I move forward? Okay, I I don't hear. Do you have a yeah. Um, when when you do the annealing, how how do you know that by by the time the temperature drops, how do you know that it's already you know it's approaching the global minimum, not just stuck? You know what I mean? <laughs> no, like, I think that. So if you go back. Up, a bunch of slides into like the very first slide where it's using annealing. Yeah. Also, oh, you mean well, how do we know we reached the, the the ground state and not a a excited state? Yeah. We don't reach the ground state. We are in the yeah. excited state. So the ground state again. This is figure. The ground state is no kink. Okay. So, so the kink density it means that you are always in in the excited state. So this is not a and this is not a uh, at this up to this time scale that that we are we, we are uh, we see the coherent behavior. We haven't reached the ground state. This is all excited state, and and in the context of uh, uh, a spin glass, this is a local minima. This is not these are not uh, uh, exact solutions. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So. Before I, I come back to this question, this which is a, which again back to the, my central question that I mentioned before, I want to touch one more topic, and that is finite size scale. I told you before that the slower you anneal, the longer the correlation length becomes. But there's a there's a limit to that. At some point, the correlation length reaches the size of the system and cannot grow more than that. The correlation cannot be bigger than the size of the system. So therefore, the size of the system defines a length scale in the correlation length. I told you also there is a relation between correlation length and time. So therefore, the size of the system introduces a time scale. Uh, for you, for your, for your evolution, but what is this time scale? I, I call it adiabatic time scale. What is, what does it mean? It means that if your annealing time is much bigger than this time scale, the system follows adiabatically through the second order phase transition point. Basically, your you you follow the ground state at the second order phase transition point and you don't excite to any of the excited states. On the opposite limit, if your time scale is much smaller than this, this, this adiabatic time scale, the effect of boundary, the effect of size will not be visible. Your correlation length is, is much shorter than the, the, the size of the system. And you basically see everything that, that the finest uh, critical scaling uh, argument predict without seeing the effect of size. But the more complicated uh, case is when this, these two time scales are of the same order, then you should see the effect of L, the effect of finite size in all the statistics, in all everything that you, you measure. How does it work? It's called something called finite size scaling onsets. What it tells you is when you have when when you have long correlation length, when you calculate macroscopic quantities, you're basically averaging over everything within the correlation length. So 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 nothing, no details within the correlation length matters. So basically, the physical quantities depend on the the ratio of correlation length and the size. Which means if I double the size and double the correlation length, 
nothing will change. So, so the physical, the average quantity that I'm, I'm measuring will remain the same. The same argument also holds for, for time. If I, so I told you the time scale that comes out of this, this finite size is this, this adiabatic time scale. And if I double this, this adiabatic time scale and double annealing time, everything should, should remain the same. And this, this gives me a concept of collapse, data collapse, which I will tell you later, but if you haven't heard of it, this is what data collapse means. So, but let me show you an example. These are the quantum annealing results and simultaneous results of, of measurements of something we call Binder cumulant. If you guys don't know Binder cumulant, don't worry about it. It doesn't affect anything. So this is just some microscopic quantity that we measure. And the, the, the real definition is on the left, but it doesn't affect anything. But when we measure this, this quantity, in both cases, quantum annealing, the, 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 the DVA machine and um, symmetry annealing, we see basically a bunch of unrelated data at different sizes from L equals to five to L equals to 12. They look unrelated. But if we scale, rescale the x-axis by L to the power minus mu, all of these data fall on the same curve. And this is what we, need, we mean by collapse. So that means there's a, a this non-universal function that if I rescale time with, with, with this adiabatic time scale, everything falls on the same curve. And this kind of collapse is very important in, in a study of critical phenomena, this kind of collapse is a signature of you looking at the second order phase transition. But more importantly, by fine tuning this new, this, this, this exponent to get this collapse to the best quality that you can, you can actually determine this mu. And this mu is the Kibel Zurich exponent that I mentioned before. So this is a way to, to experimentally and numerically extract this Kibel Zurich exponent in, in the, these two dynamics. And <clears throat> what we find is, this is the, the literature value of Kibazuric exponent that, that, that I mentioned earlier, and these are the experimental results, and there's a, a very close agreement between the experimental result and the theory. And what it tells me is this machine, up to 5,000 qubits, is doing something very well in agreement, but with, with predictions of quantum mechanics at 5,000 qubits, which is, which is not simulatable by any, any classical uh, approaches. So now, again, I, I still haven't answered this question. Can quantum mechanics speed up optimization? So, I can rephrase this now, now that I know this mu, this, this, this key exponent, Kibel Zurich exponent that I can actually calculate and measure and by collapse and everywhere, and it's in the literature. I know that quantum mechanically, this is smaller than classical, but does it mean that the energy decay is faster uh, than classical? So theoretically it is, the answer is yes. If you could measure the system at the critical point, if you could stop at the critical point, so because we are annealing not at the critical, we're annealing to the end of deep in this, this spin glass phase, but if we could stop the annealing at the critical point and measure, you would find a relation between this exponent of any residual energy versus time and other critical exponents. This is, I would say, the main contribution of Anders Sandvik to, to give us this formula uh, and the derivation of this formula as well. And what this ds means is it is a, the, a spatial dimension, which is three in our case, and for, for classical and for quantum is a spatial dimension plus uh, dynamical, dynamic exponent. But you see now exactly the inverse relation between kappa c and mu. So the smaller the mu, the larger kappa c. That means the, the faster the case. So, so this, this 
relation that I predicted before that mu, smaller mu means faster dynamics. This now tells you that it means faster decay of energy as well. And now we, if we do exp uh, uh, numerically for quantum annealing, quantum Monte Carlo, and theoretically for quantum annealing, quantum Monte Carlo, and symmetry annealing, we see that quantum annealing is better than quantum Monte Carlo, and quantum Monte Carlo is better than symmetry annealing. And this agrees with, with what we, we saw before. This is the, 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 the plot that I mentioned before uh, at the beginning of this presentation. Here, the slope now is, is, is uh, we fit a line into the slope to, to, to find this exponent. And we see if a little bit deviation from the, the prediction. And this deviation could be due to, we are not measuring at the critical point. This prediction was if you measure at the critical point, but we are annealing to the end, to the end of the, deep into the spin glass and any dynamics after the critical point can change this, this behavior, but the change is not big enough to, to change the order. So the order that quantum is better than all classical still remains. Experimentally also quantum is better than all classical. And even, even quantum Monte Carlo becomes very, very close to the symmetry annealing. So this difference between ideal and annealing to the end also happens with quantum Monte Carlo. So, uh, so now uh, the, the conclusion is now there's a theoretical support of this order and it can be directly related to critical dynamics at the critical point. That's why D wave scaled better than quantum Monte Carlo and quantum Monte Carlo scaled better than symmetry annealing. It is completely can be predicted by by just looking at critical exponents and, and things that we can calculate independently. Okay, so I wanna add a couple of more points before I finish. So let me, I, I hope I can get to the uh, final topic, but if I don't, that's okay. So one more point is about the, uh, uh, I mentioned we, in this plot, we are looking at a scaling of residual energy with, with time. However, in, in for complexity people, you care about a scaling of time with size. What can we say about a scaling of time with size? Indeed, by definition of this adiabatic time scale that I, I told you before, adiabatic time scale is L to the power of mu, and L is basically the number of cubic to the power of one over D. Basically, there is, there is a relation between this time scale, which is the most important time scale in dynamics, and the number of qubits in your system. So, and if I put the numbers, quantum and classical, you see that there's a, a, a square root relation between tau classical and tau quantum, which reminds you of, I mean, not exactly a square, it's not exactly two. The ratio is not exactly two. But it is almost two. It's a kind of similar to Grover search, although this is absolutely not Grover search. It's not. Uh, this is a, a has nothing to do with Grover algorithm. But there's still, there's this disadvantage, and the collapse data I showed you is the proof of this happening experimentally and numerically. So, so if there was no, there was no relation like this this collapse would not happen. So basically, I already have shown you evidence of this, this advantage of uh, time scale, quantum time scale with respect to classical time scale. Another point that I wanna, I wanna emphasize is uh, in this plot, I showed the x-axis quantum annealing in nanoseconds and a spin uh, symmetry annealing and, uh, and quantum Monte Carlo in Monte Carlo sweeps. But I don't tell you how long it takes for, for one Monte Carlo. One color sweep means a, a sweep that you flip all the qubits in one sweep. 
and it doesn't tell you how long it takes for Monte Carlo sweeps. If you if you want to do apple to apple, you have to turn this into nanoseconds as well. And this a a plot of that. In this plot, we unlike this one. In this plot, we ask this simulator and the quantum Monte Carlo to solve the logical problem. We don't ask them to solve the embedded problem, which every logical qubit is two qubits. So we, we represent every logical qubit as one qubit, as one spin. Because classically, you don't need to, 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 to do this embedding, but quantum machine requires that because of the, the, the graph that we have. But even so, when you calculate how long it takes for a single core uh, computer to uh, reach so this is the, 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 the longest annealing time that the system follows quantum uh, mechanically before the temperature starts. And if you look at the, the, the time scale, you see that there's a factor of 1,000 speed of compared to class simulator annealing and a factor of 100 million a speed of compared to quantum Monte Carlo, if you really look at the time uh, directly. <clears throat> but then if you go to longer annealing time, this temperature starts and screws up this, this, this favorable scaling and the gap between these quantum and classical becomes smaller and smaller. If we could continue this quantum mechanically, which means if we could improve coherence up to one microsecond, which is not a lot, one microsecond is, is achievable, the distance between quantum and uh, the simultaneity would be 100,000 and 1 billion compared to quantum Monte Carlo. So the, the speed up would be 100,000, 1, 1 billion. But this coherent evolution requires, uh, uh, the coherent annealing, imp improving coherent annealing requires significant uh, improvement of uh, in fabrication, which is the bottleneck of our developments, costliest and time most time confusing, consuming the uh, development that we have, but we will get there. But can we shortcut that? Can we do uh, uh, improve this, in, extend this range without improving coherence? And this is the, 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 the final topic, yes, with quantum error mitigation. This is a, a paper we, pub, we put on the archive a month ago. I'm just showing the results first, and then if, if there's a time, I can just give a few words what it is. This is a, the, again, kink density in 1D spin chain, thermal spin chain, and this is the, the behavior we had before, and then the start of showing the, the excitations due to temperature and temperature dependence. But we, if we measure everything and extrapolate back to zero temperature, so it is a three cross sections, and we put that measurement and extrapolate back to the zero temperature, you get a, these, these black points, which actually follow the exact up to one order of magnitude more longer. And this is a, a, a way of doing it by temperature. This is called zero noise extrapolation. There's another way of talking of doing it by rescaling J. I don't think I have time to get into this, but uh, I would actually go to the end because I want to have a few minutes for anybody who asks questions. In the end, basically you can you can do both ways by rescaling energy and, and, and uh, time. And this brings me to the final a slide, which is conclusions. Uh, I showed you that quantum annealing has faster critical dynamics than, than both quantum Monte Carlo and cemented annealing. These are the, the annealing algorithms that, that do something similar uh, to DV. And this faster dynamics is, is obvious just by looking at the, the uh, kibbles exponent. I show you that faster dynamics means also faster divergence to approximate solutions. So this, is, this has the direct relevance to quantum optimization. And both theory and experiments support this, this scaling advantage. And finally, I, with just a couple of slides, I showed you that there is a possibility to improve 
the uh, coherence for some quantities, for, for average quantities, uh, if you do uh, quantum error mitigation. I thank everybody for listening, and I want to stop here and ask if there is any question. Can you hear us? Yes, please. Hi. Uh, just a question of this coherent annealing. Just trying to understand. Like, does it mean that the is it like the qubit coherence that we're usually like using universal, um, like gate model stuff, or is it something else? Like, no, this is not universal gate model. Uh, there is no, so I show you some evidence that, that quantum annealing actually can give you some advantage because of this critical dynamics. There is no evidence of gate model universal can give you any advantage in, in optimization. Uh, this is not a universal gate model. It's just a, it's a coherent annealing. My question is like, what's what's the like meaning of co coherent annealing? Like, is it is it? Like related to the coherence times of these qubits, or is it actually something else? No, that this, this means that during this time, before so so before this this uh, temperature starts screwing up the, the the dynamics, there is a region it was short annealing times that the annealing time is is shorter than. Uh, relaxation time or or time uh, defacing time or time scale that environment affects the qubits. So the qubits remain coherent during the annealing, at least during the 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 time you pass the critical point. That's what it means. Yes. I have a question here. Okay. Mohammed, that's a great talk, but a follow-up question: What you just uh, what you just said? So you're claiming a new coherence time now. At least I suppose you can define a new coherence time related to the detachment of these curves, which you just showed. But my question is: Which coherence time is that? Is this a single qubit coherence time, or is it some multi-qubit coherence time? So this is a. I would say this is not really uh, a coherence time. It appears, so, so remember, all you are doing is you do some measurements. These are real measurements. And then you extrapolate. And you, this extrapolation will help you to, to uh, so, so let me just, just one more slide. So the, the idea is, uh, I didn't want to spend, the idea is you, the idea of zero noise extrapolation is you amplify noise by some known factor. You measure expectation values at different lambda. You fit to a polynomial and you extrapolate to zero. And then the, 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 the zero order coefficient of this, extra, uh, this polynomial is your noise free expectation value. So this is this gives you information about expectation values, but it doesn't give you a sample. It doesn't it doesn't really every sample or every every measurement of D of, of of your machine. This is not just for DV or even gate models. They, they use this a lot. This doesn't mean that your your machine is more coherent. This means that you can get information about as if your machine was more coherent. So so what I mean is in like for example in this case. Uh, we, do, we do this extrapolation and then you see one order of magnitude longer. For this, for 1D chain, we, we have this, this uh, Jordan Wigner. We know how this, this, this theoretically should, should follow. But there are some problems that you don't know. You don't know at, I don't know, 100, 200 nanoseconds what you would expect for, for expectation values. With this error mitigation, you can actually make predictions that this, this is what a, a quantum machine should give you uh, at this analytic time. So this is not a, a real 
extension of coherence, but it's just like a getting expectation value of as if the system was more coherent. Did I answer you, the, the Ogeria? Well, yeah, I, I, not quite. What I'm saying is this, that based on what you're telling me, it seems to me that this plot gives rise to a new coherence time scale. So let's forget about error mitigation for now. Yeah. Uh, it seems to me that there is a, you know, for, for each temperature, you can associate um, a maximum annealing time where the, the actual hardware follows closely the exact solution exact coherent quantum annealing solution. So it seems to me that now you can extract a time scale from this plot. And what I'm asking is how is that time scale related to single qubit coherence time? And is it related to single qubit coherence time? Or maybe is it multi-qubit coherence time? Uh, I think, I mean? so, so I can answer you this way. If you really wanted a a real quantum machine gives you this extrapolated curves, you really needed a, a, a qubit which is 10 times more coherent, having 10 times longer coherence time. Mm -hmm. But what I'm saying is our machine does not have 10 times longer coherence time. These are yeah. extrapolation of data that, that gives you results in agreement with as yeah. if the machine had 10 times longer coherence time. Yeah. Yeah. I accept that. Yeah. Yeah. So it uh, this does not correct or or improve coherence of the machine itself. It improves the result that you get by extrapolating the result. Yeah. Thanks. You're welcome. So in SFU, we have a question. I think this uh, might be the last question we have time for. Uh, it's a very technical one, I think. Mama, thank you for the talk. In the 1D icing glass, at very long annealed times, it looked like the order of the different uh, different curves corresponding to different temperatures inverted. If you go back to that figure for the 1D icing glass. This one or the temperature one? Oh, no, sorry. Uh, way back, yeah. This one? This is one the icing glass as a function of temperature. This is the new data. But you may you from the 2022 paper, I think. Okay, so I can show that. But it was a long way back. Yeah. Yeah, this one. Yeah, so very long times past 10 to the three. Yeah. The water is actually inverting from what I'd expect. Uh, say it again, the, the last sentence. The order of the curves with temperature is inverting. So before 10 to 3 makes sense to me that the colder temperatures are performing with the lower kink density, and then this inverts. Okay, so what's happening is, so the, this is the, 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 the small j is actually it's more clear. So first of all, you have coherence, and then Kibel-Zurich mechanism makes you lower the energy or lower the, the number of kinks as a function of time. But then there's a region that, that the longer you wait, you, the longer you anneal, the more you expose your system to thermal environment. So basically, the longer you anneal, the, 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 the more you kink you find. But if you do it very long time, then you start to actually recombine these kinks and then lower the energy again. So there's a, a mm -hmm. three regions three regions, uh, one is coherent annealing, thermal excitation, and then, then basically lowering energy again, because if you, if you, if you anneal very slowly, then the system starts to uh, relax to the ground state at longer and longer annealing times. Interesting, thanks. You're welcome. This this region that that goes up is called anti cubic switch. So some people call this cubic switch an anti cubic switch regime. Thank you so much, Mohammed, for your talk, and thank you so much to everyone for attending. Um, thank you very much. Thank you.
we will see you all hopefully at more of our seminars in the new year. Thank you.